Louis Vuitton is debatably the most classic clothing brand in the world. It's been a staple of celebrity fashion for more than a century, with patrons ranging from Audrey Hepburn to the Empress of France. The company was founded by its namesake, Louis Vuitton, in 1854, and has quickly grown to one of the biggest brands on earth. The company operates in 50 countries with more than 460 stores worldwide. However, beyond the glitz and glamour are lesser-known stories of the company and its origins. Today, we are counting down 10 things you didn't know about Louis Vuitton. We all know that Louis Vuitton is a luxury brand. Their bags are consistently sold for thousands of dollars apiece. But how many people can realistically afford such a ridiculous price? It turns out they must have numerous customers, because the company has a valuation of $33 billion, making it the 15th most valuable brand in the world. This stems from its superior business model, with profit margins north of 30%. Louis Vuitton launched its first perfume in 70 years during 2016, and LVMH built a state-of-the-art fragrance factory to develop the perfumes. The company produced seven fragrances that retail for $240 for the smallest bottle. Maison Louis Vuitton launched a new Paris flagship store in 2017, and the brand will celebrate its 165th anniversary next year. On top of this, the truth is that their bags are not expensive to make. They rely on the same low-cost labor as any major clothing company in the world. But when you mark up your bags 3,000% of their total total cost of production, you're going to have a pretty hefty profit. Keep in mind that this superlative is not exclusive to clothing brands. For example, Louis Vuitton is worth more than IBM, Nike, Verizon, and BMW. The Louis Vuitton label was founded by Vuitton in 1854 on Rue Neuve de Capucines in Paris, France. Louis Vuitton had observed that trunks could be easily stacked. In 1858, Vuitton introduced his flat-bottom trunks with Tryon on canvas, making them lightweight and airtight. Before the introduction of Vuitton's trunks, rounded top trunks were used, generally to promote water runoff, and thus could not be stacked. It was Vuitton's gray Tryon canvas flat trunk that allowed the ability to stack with ease for voyages. In this way, Vuitton completely revolutionized the world of hand luggage and fashion simultaneously. Many other luggage makers imitated LV's style and design. The company participated in the 1867 Universal Exhibition in Paris. To protect against the duplication of his look, Vuitton changed the Tryon design to a beige and brown stripes design in 1878. By 1885, the company opened its first store in London on Oxford Street. Soon thereafter, due to the continuing imitation of his look, in 1888, Vuitton created the Damier canvas pattern, which bore a logo that reads Marc L. Vuitton de Bose, which translates into L. Vuitton registered trademark. In 1892, Louis Vuitton died, and the company's management passed to his son. Beyond their elitist mindset, there's another major skeleton in Louis Vuitton's closet. It was recently revealed that the family had links to the French Vichy government, who collaborated with the Nazis during the occupation in World War II. Not only did the company benefit financially from their dealings with the Nazis and the Vichy government, but also they fabricated images of the chief of state of the Vichy to positively promote his image. The company has tried to distance themselves from this dark part of their past, but the fact remains, the entire Vuitton family collaborated with Nazis for financial gain. Some even argue that the brand would never have reached its current status if not for its association with fascist governments. While most other companies were economically depressed during World War II, Vuitton was making big moves in the political world. When researching this story, reporters stated that they were given full cooperation by the firm. But when they asked about its wartime activities, they were told that the company documents for the years 1930 to 1945 had been destroyed in a fire. This is a pretty convenient period of time for the company to lose contact with, as it would be even more incriminating. Many are still tempted to buy Louis Vuitton products, but the question remains, is it worth supporting a company that's still hiding from its Nazi past? According to Louis Vuitton's press materials, every one of their handbags is handmade, with most taking a full week to complete. However, the brand had a serious scandal when it was revealed that the majority of their bags were constructed with sewing machines by laborers in compromised working conditions, with just a small portion of the process completed by hand. The LVMH Group, owner of Louis Vuitton, ran advertisements showing workers using a needle and thread and other artisanal techniques. Wording emphasized the individual attention to detail lavished on each product. But this backfired when a business watchdog revealed evidence that LVMH outsources their products almost identically to all other brands. The company responded but declined to give full details of its production techniques, explaining that the images were an homage to the craftsmanship of its 200 artisans. It said there were more than 100 stages of production for each bag and wallet. Hand sewing machines were used for some aspects because they were more secure and necessary for strength, accuracy, and durability. This claim has been disputed by numerous sources. So far, it seems like the jury is still out on the true quality of LVMH's products. LVMH works tirelessly to give their products the mystique of exclusivity. For one thing, they never put their bags on discount, even if they have overstock. 
This creates the illusion that there are always a precious few bags available, though it's not always the case. This technique has been emulated by other luxury brands like Gucci and Lululemon, who consciously keep their products from being discounted. Beyond this, Louis Vuitton goes to wasteful extremes to ensure there will never be a glut of their products. At the end of every fashion season, LVMH collects its unsold products, returns them to France, and burns them. Things that cannot be burned, such as watches, are smashed and thrown in the trash. It's hard to imagine a less ecologically sound business model, but LVMH is determined to make their products appear rare, regardless of the consequences. And in this case, the conspiracy goes even deeper. By destroying unused products, brands that import goods into the US stand to benefit from the drawback, or the return of certain duties, internal and revenue taxes, and certain fees collected upon the importation of products into the US, for instance, from France. That is to say that by returning and destroying their goods, LVMH actually receives a tax refund from countries like the US and Italy. Of course, it seems wrong to incentivize the destruction of merchandise, but LVMH continues to exploit this loophole. Of all of LVMH's handbags, the Alma is perhaps the most iconic, but not many people know its true origins. Most people think that Louis Vuitton Alma was launched in the 1930s, but the bag was actually custom designed back in 1925. The House of Louis Vuitton designed the bag at the request of none other than Madame Gabrielle Chanel. It was years later that Coco gave her permission to manufacture the bag for the general public. It was Gatson Louis Vuitton who designed this classic beauty, and he named it the Squire. Its second name was the Champs Elysees. Eventually, the bag was donned the Alma, which stands for the square that marks the spot where the Avenue Montaigne meets the Seine River. The Louis Vuitton Alma bag was the second handbag of the fashion house, and was just as much of a success as its sister, the Speedy. Of course, the Speedy was a favorite of Audrey Hepburn. The connection between Coco and Alma has, however, been kept a secret for a very long time. The interlocking L and V with floral pattern was designed by Louis Vuitton's son, Georges Vuitton, in 1896 as a way to brand his nascent box and luggage business. And in the 120 years since, it's become one of the most recognizable logos in the world. This addition was made after the founder passed away, and many wonder if the brand would have found the same notoriety if his son had not devised this brilliant logo. Though the basic image has stayed the same, it's undergone small changes over the years. Marc Jacobs' entrance as Louis Vuitton's creative director in 1997 was when the monogram received countless updates. His first update came in the form of the monogram Vernus line, which saw the quatrefoils and flowers become embossed instead of printed onto shiny Vernus leather. Jacobs and his team introduced pop art sensibilities into the Louis Vuitton umbrella, partnering first with artist Steven Sprouse for a neon graffitied rendition of this monogram. It was the first but not the last time the monogram would be redefined during his 16-year tenure. The tan leather used alongside the monogram is all natural and contains no dye or chemical coloring, which is why it darkens over time. Orphaned at an early age, Louis Vuitton started working as a packer and box maker at the workshop of Romain Maréchal in Paris at the age of 16. Using carpentry skills picked up doing odd jobs along his long trek by foot from his hometown in the Jura region to the French capital, Vuitton flourished as a maker of custom-designed wood boxes that housed anything from mirrors, clocks, flowers, paintings, to makeup. When he opened his own shop, Louis Vuitton Maletier, in 1854, he marketed himself as a specialist packer for discerning travelers, seeking a professional who safely packs the most fragile of objects. His service was in high demand by travelers eager to explore newly established shipping and train routes at the time, and his business boomed after the Empress of France, Eugénie de Montillo, appointed Vuitton as her personal packer and trunk maker. That's right, Vuitton got his big break when Napoleon's wife made him her official trunk maker. Talk about a lucrative internship. This virtually guaranteed Vuitton prosperity and helped him make the professional contacts he would need to launch his brand. In the end, it was a Prussian connection that landed the Vuitton brand on a major global scale. Because he was working in a pre-globalized world, not much was known about Louis Vuitton's personal life, until recently, that is. When Gaston Louis Vuitton died, the contents of his office were packed up, stored away, and eventually forgotten. But in early 2017, the Vuitton family opened up the trunk to see what it contained. The collection included such oddities as board games, among them a French version of Snakes and Ladders, 19th century carpet bags, and more than 800 subas, a Japanese sword guard that is often composed of an ornate piece of metal that delineates the sword's edges and its handle. As the first male heir of the third generation of the family, Vuitton was destined to work at the company, but he developed a broad range of hobbies, designing furniture, sketching landscapes, and taking photographs. He also began to collect art, ranging from African masks to Art Deco crystals, and he was a prolific reader, dazzled by the fiction of writers such as J.K. Hoosmans. On top of this, the chest revealed trinkets such as wood figurines, dolls, and model cars. It seems that Vuitton had a fairly eclectic taste, if his personal possessions are to serve as an indicator. 
Before the days of security passwords and pins, the whole world relied on good old-fashioned locks. Vuitton concentrated on this project, helping the closing system of trunks evolve to make them impenetrable and inimitable. He worked with different types of locks, going from one supplier to the next, always seeking a more ingenious system and the best way to counter the new problems of the era. In 1896, after years of research, he arrived at a breakthrough. In an era where travelers transported all of their personal effects in wardrobes and trunks that would attract envy and, unfortunately, thieves as well, this trunk maker dared to create the only lock that was supposedly unpickable. He was so confident in his product that he challenged the legendary escape artist and magician Harry Houdini. The dare was to get out of a box closed with a Louis Vuitton lock. With an onlooking crowd, Houdini wasn't able to escape, and the lock's efficiency was proved. Though some have speculated that Houdini was compensated for this publicity stunt, the world may never know. The fact remains that the lock is a consistent element on all Louis Vuitton products to this day.